Good day, everyone, and welcome to TVUP with the program Health Issues. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. Last year, we experienced the entry of a pandemic called COVID-19. Today, we're experiencing a second surge of COVID-19. Last year, we were at a loss of what to do with the, how to address this pandemic. And several people in the University of the Philippines decided to band together to try to help the government fight the pandemic. We're very lucky today to have this group join us, led by our guest, the Executive Director of the uh, UP Resilience Institute, Professor Mahar Lagmay, uh, Hello. The, dean, the Dean from the UP uh, uh, Graduate School in Los Baños, uh, Jomar Rabahante, and uh, Professor Peter Kaiton from the School of Statistics in UP Diliman. They will share with us the experience and the story of how the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team was formed. Mahar, uh, about January last year, you, the UPRI was struggling to fight another disaster, which was the uh, Taal volcano eruption, remember? And, uh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell us That's about right. that story. Yeah, January 12, Taal Volcano erupted suddenly, uh, putting, uh, catching everybody by surprise. No? A lot of uh, tourists, weekend tourists, all over Tagaytay Ridge and around the Taal Lake, they took pictures of the eruption. And that eruption uh, was called or is called in the volcanological commu community as a preato magmatic eruption where magma and the lake water in the main crater lake mixed and uh, it generated uh, an explosive event that gave rise to a plume that is about 17 kilometers high some say it's more than it's more than 20 about 21 kilometers the ash that fell uh, reached all the way to Nueva Ecija and Nueva Vizcaya but uh, just in little amounts Metro Manila also experienced the ash, but uh, closer to the volcano, there was a lot of ash uh, that was spread by that eruption. It continued until a uh, couple of days, uh, slowly waning, but throughout that time, it displaced a lot of people. Uh, people had to go to the evacuation centers. Um, a lot of people were... Uh, put at a discomfort because of the ash. And that is actually quite dangerous. Uh, there's a disease called uh, uh, pneumonosilico volcanoconiosis. If I'm not mistaken, it's the longest word in the dictionary. And that is because that is a disease caused by the minute ash particles that get lodged into your lungs. No? And uh, after some time, you develop that disease. And throughout that period, when uh, a lot of people were evacuated, the UP system, uh, volunteers were mobilized. So we were busy helping the evacuees. We gave out tents, we uh, sent food, and uh, a lot of other donations, along with the UP men's basketball team. You know, you know where to go but up. They all helped, but UP had a concerted effort to help uh, those uh, that uh, were in trouble. The month before, or two months before, there was also something similar that happened in Mindanao. So those were our uh, initial uh, types of work uh, that uh, UP, the entire UP system, uh, where the UP uh, system banded together to help our countrymen. But uh, I think the it was already in place uh, since the time when Sendong happened, that was in 2011, but not uh, as organized as uh, in the couple of years, in the last couple of years. And then but, after that, uh, after Taal, I think that was our, our uh, preparation for the COVID pandemic. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because people were required to uh, wear masks. Wear masks. And... Right now, uh, that, we're also wearing masks. That's a very interesting story, Mahar, because uh, Resilience Institute was built 
and you're a geologist to actually address uh, natural calamities like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes that you describe, and meteorologic events. But uh, suddenly, our resilience is now being tested with this pandemic. You know, it's, it's already the, our second year into this pandemic. And uh, luckily, when the UPRI was formed and you headed it, you started not only research, but you had the uh, operational response to all these different uh, uh, geological events that happened. So I, I think the platform of what you led was actually already there. And maybe you should describe to the people what UPRI had, because you had, you had a NOAA project that looked at geographic information system and hazard mapping. You had a team that would go to a site and study the, uh, the geologic events. So can you give me an idea of what UPRI did prior to the pandemic? Yes, that's, that's correct. No? You, the question's uh, on point. Uh, the beauty about uh, the UP Resilience Institute is that it has this core component. The core component is uh, called U the UP NOAA Center. Uh, the UP NOAA Center uh, has uh, a lot of experience because of its researchers that have been working. We are, were able to maintain them because they have been working on this kind of work wherein uh, IT is uh, considered as very important, developing a platform so that people can see the outputs of the research of the experts, the faculty members from the entire of UP. Uh, NOAA, uh, which stands for Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, was a, a consolidation of all of the research outputs uh, mainly from the University of the Philippines. No? Uh, there were a lot of experts working for NOAA, uh, researchers as well, and they started working on floods, landslides, and other kinds of hazards, uh, deploying uh, real-time sensors all over the Philippines with the Department of Science and Technology, uh, doing research cutting edge using cutting-edge technologies for the benefit of the Filipinos so that we can become more resilient. So since 2017, the University of the Philippines adopted NOAA, and it's now called UP NOAA Center, uh, maintaining a lot of those uh, that have worked for NOAA from 2012 to 2016. So that means that we had a lot of people who are experienced in, in doing this kind of work uh, related to disaster risk reduction. In other uh, words, you had a team of disaster scientists, researchers, yes, professors, yes, uh, researchers, academics uh, that were in right, one place, the right. UP Resilience Institute. That's right. So, so that at about that same time that the volcano erupted in Taal, there was a mysterious disease that occurred in a seafood market in Wuhan. And this turned out to be what we all face today, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And can you tell us the story of how the UP COVID-19 uh, pandemic response team was eventually formed? Well, it was because of your order as the executive <laughs> vice president. Of course, upon the no, order... No, I, I ordered you... it because I was talking to you and you said you wanted to do something. That's what you told me. You said, can UPRI yes. do something? And I said, of course, I'll help you. I said, let's form a whole team because you, had the, uh, you have the data scientists... You had the uh, mappers, geologic mappers. You had the uh, statistics people, and you had the uh, bioinformatics experts who were doing yeah. this thing for disaster. So I said, let's get together. And it was initially informal, but I decided as the EVP of UP, I cannot, you know, we cannot make it work if it wasn't formalized. So I had to put yeah. together a formal piece of paper creating that team. But, but the idea yeah. was it, you were really a disaster Disaster Science Institute. You're already looking at disaster risk reduction. You had the element. Yeah, that is right. We, in fact, we've been helping plan communities, local government units to uh, become more resilient through anticipatory planning. Uh, we put their plans in their comprehensive land use plans, their uh, climate, uh, their SIDRA or uh, climate and disaster risk assessment their disaster risk reduction and management plans. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been doing. 
Now, when uh, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, problem arose, uh, what happened was, uh, yes, we received this uh, order from the Office of the President, no? uh, signed by you with uh, PDLC, uh, President Danilo Concepcion. And when we received that, uh, what we did was uh, we tried to contact uh, as many people as we can. Uh, faculty members, friends, researchers, students, as well as volunteers, uh, UP mm -hmm. alumni, who wanted to help fight COVID-19. And uh, the response was very good. No? Um, in fact, before this pandemic, I did not know Jomar. Uh, mm -hmm. Peter, I know somehow, but not as close as now. Um, because uh, Peter is a friend of, uh, I think, BA. Uh, I think he's been helping out with some other uh, uh, statistical work on weather-related problems. And uh, when we made the call for volunteers to help uh, in the effort to fight COVID, there was a, a, a huge response. You know? Wonderful. Uh, really a huge response. You can really see that the UP people uh, the students, alumni, the faculty, they live sa Tagalog eh, para sa bayan. No? So, uh, so we I got all these volunteers yeah. uh, helping out uh, That's right. with a lens, no, with a lens no from monetary... disaster risk reduction, right? So the, the people that all volunteered were looking at COVID-19 or the pandemic from a DRR lens. That's what I noticed. That's right. So everybody wanted to help. Uh, what we needed to do was organize it. No? Okay. And uh, the reason why we had uh, a platform now called as ncov.ph. I don't remember, maybe Jomar and Peter can uh, tell us why, wh where the word... Wait, before he talks that, maybe you have to tell them how we met and how we talked and formulated stuff. We used a platform called uh, Facebook Messenger. <laughs> Remember? Yes, yeah. All communications <laughs> were, communica were through either Facebook Messenger or Viber. In yes. fact, I if, if if I'm not mistaken, I have more than uh, 50 Facebook groups, no, uh, Messenger groups, because uh, you cannot put them all together. Although we have one main, uh, there are many that we need to talk uh, to separately. So the, the, the end of, uh, actually it was a suggestion by the GIS mappers uh, yes. from Bay. And uh, that was the platform by which we show all of the outputs of the experts and volunteers coming from the University of the Philippines system. Again, okay. I'd like to emphasize system because it's not only Diliman, it's not only Manila, it's not only LB. Uh, the mathematicians uh, have grouped together, uh, mathematicians of UP Mindanao, UP Visayas, they call themselves as uh, the one UP modeling group, if, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. So the end of platform is really to showcase what we have done no, as outputs related to the COVID pandemic. But, but before uh, so we go to the end yeah. of then, I'd like to, to tell the story to the, to the audience and the people watching on how I met also some of the most important ones. And maybe I'll go to Jomar, Dr. Uh, Professor Jomar Abahante, Dean, Dean Jomar. Now he's the Dean. <laughs> At that time, he was just Professor. Uh, Jomar, uh, I think Jomar, together with a veterinary professor who's doing his uh, PhD in uh, UC Davis, uh, Darwin Bandoy, were instrumental in describing in our messenger groups the importance of mathematical uh, modeling for this biologic event, for this particular epidemic. So maybe I can call on Jomar to tell the story of his contribution in the field of bioinformatics uh, and how you actually convinced Mahar and myself, uh, me being a medical doctor, on the use of your science and tell us more a little bit about uh, bioinformatics. Jomar? Yes, uh, good afternoon, EVP Ted. Um, this, this work uh, about COVID-19 actually uh, started around February pa. Even we, we still don't have the ECQ. 
we are already doing some simulations, mathematical models, uh, February pa lang. Because uh, in UPLB, we had the issue if we're going to continue the you know, Feb Fair or not. <laughs> Remember that, that time? Yes, yes, yes. So. Uh, we know there are already uh, people from Wuhan or China coming to the Philippines, but we're still not uh, uh, closing our borders. So we, there, there were some discussions if we're going to continue the paper or not. So some, some administrators in UPLB asked us to, to do some modeling. Um, but but uh, the good, well, COVID is not a good thing, but the good thing <laughs> that probably this pandemic brought us is we were able to, to create a network. Um, the, the mathematicians all over the UP system from Baguio, Diliman, LB, Visayas, Mindanao, Cebu, Cebu. We already have this kind of group. We call ourselves as mathematical biologists. We actually have um, our annual workshops. Start, starting 2018, we had that in Cebu, and then Bohol 20, 2019. Then 2020 in LB. That's January. <laughs> January, we had our workshop. And the focus of that workshop is mathematical epidemiology. <laughs> And we, uh, of course, we are, we, we are already doing some works with uh, uh, projects, but of not, not, not in terms of COVID, uh, macroparasite, dengue, we already have those kinds of, of projects. But we didn't realize that after January, <laughs> we, our work will be highlighted in a big scale, national scale, because of this COVID-19. So, well, Jomar, uh, uh, to tell you frankly, uh, I was under Secretary of Health prior to being EVP. And had I known that there was this one mathematics group that does bioinformatics, I would have dragged you all in to all the epidemics that we handled. We had MERS-CoV, we had that mysterious disease in Mindanao, we had all this uh, cholera outbreak in Catanduanes. And had I known that there was a bioinformatics expertise in the UP system, I would have tapped that. So this was a discovery as well, like uh, Mahar, we discovered the, the you, the bioinformatic, how do you call it? Bioinformaticians, <laughs> but the people in mathematical biology, the people mm -hmm. in math. And you, you showed us very nice projections in the beginning in our, remember you were sharing your graphs in our messenger mm -hmm. discussion groups. We were, and I was sharing it to my doctor friends who were also being alarmed at the projections and everything. So tell us more about how you developed those uh, you were running the numbers through a SEIR modeling or something or whatever, right? The SIR modeling is actually one of the uh, very basic <laughs> models that we study in, in mathematical epidemiology. And uh, as you can see, we, it, it's just a purely uh, few sets of equations and very easy to, to run. Um, but what we found out is that even with this very simple mathematical equation, set of mathematical equations, we can somehow do some projections to, to tell the people what might be the strategic move to inhibit or control the further spread of um, COVID-19 virus. Um, there, there are more uh, complicated models, but we, we, we see that during the early stage of the pandemic, it's very important to have a very simple model so we can explain to the public. That's yes. actually the challenge. Eh? Um, because we can, we can make our projections, our models very complicated, but it will not be, you know, our results will not be uh, 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 sort of, it will not be uh, parang I understood your people. models. I'm a doctor. I <laughs> yeah. have no mathematical. That's yeah. why I went to medicine. I hated mathematics. So when you had all those graphs and projections, it was clear. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was consolidating it with my uh, knowledge of epidemiology and disease. Mm -hmm. uh, those graphs were very clear to me. And uh, I just wish I had those information later. So it became, it was useful to me. It was useful to the people that were mm -hmm. going to look at our website. So, so let me go to Peter. Because Peter is our statistician <laughs> expert. And when he came in, he started crunching these numbers from these local governments. And he had this compendium. <laughs> you know, you know, he had this compendium of what happens in every barangay, in every city. So, Peter, can you tell us how, 
your role came in into uh, uh, converting your statistical knowledge into the uh, into useful information for all of us in this pandemic. So before I came into the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team, I'm typically uh, just commenting about the statistics going around because uh, even before the ECQ in March 2020, there have been a lot of these projections done by Jomar, done by Darwin, and also done by different experts. And I'm just the Ateneo group, like, the Ateneo group. <laughs> the, a lot of groups, in fact, a lot of groups. So I've been like looking at the different models and critiquing them into social media. And then I got folded into one group that where Jomar is a part of. And then with through Jomar, I got pulled into the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. So that's how we got you. <laughs> then you were now feeding us with this, your compendium, yes, which is an yes, analysis yes. of the, which is a fantastic uh, amount of information. And by the way, I love your virtual background. Can you tell us yes, yes, who yes. they are? <laughs> they are um, uh, a lot of the members of the UP COVID nineteen pandemic response team. So as uh, Dr. Mahar has said, we are. Uh, we are, the team is part of a lot of individuals coming from Baguio to Davao. And this is just a small group of that larger group of that system cooperation for us to uh, tackle the current crisis that we are in. And, and we've never met each other. We've I mean, never met each us, other online. <laughs> all of us in the pandemic response, we have never physically been in one conference room or one meeting room discussing the pandemic. Mahar, can I ask you, uh, how, how, how was it to be able to get together? Uh, uh, how, so so the, the team was formed. There were volunteers that came in. You had bioinformatics experts, mathematical epidemiologists, but you have statisticians coming in. You, we, we all also had other experts, right, Mahar? Uh, comms experts yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, governance yeah. experts. Tell, tell us about those. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Social media played a, a big part in consolidating everybody into the into the UP pandemic response team. No? The, the network as well, the UP network. Uh, it started by making the call, I think, and uh, the the executive order that was uh, the memo memorandum that was received. Uh, I knew some friends. I had some friends from high school, the Nanasama. And I think uh, they knew Jomar. So we established that Facebook group. And then people started to invite people that they knew. And when they got in, lumaki ng lumaki yung pandemic response team, uh, bringing people together to work on the problem. No? So it's a group composed of Statisticians, mathematicians, mappers, geographers. Uh, we have people from NCPAG, from national. Yes, we social have... scientists as social well. Scientists. In fact, there's a pandemic response for a uh, group for mga social scientists. No? We even uh, integrated with the uh, psych uh, psychologists. No? Uh, yeah, we yeah, had one part in the NCOV. Uh, uh, a, a platform for psychological consultation. Uh, people from NCPAG, people from sociology. Pu public health. Uh, and public health. So, yeah, public health, uh, epidemiology. Uh, from Los Baños, marami rin mga, mga uh, mathematicians na nandun. You also had filmmakers that made Filmmakers videos. also. Uh, uh, it only goes to show that the, the problem cuts across all sectors, di ba? Um, it's not just one field. It's, pure, it's really interdisciplinary. Kasi you, you have to make, as Jomar was saying kanina, uh, make the science embraced by the people. No? And okay. to be able to do that, you have to have a holistic view. Not just pure engineering or not just pure science, but you really have to uh, get them together to be able to have a better approach to the problem. So, so let's and, talk uh, about that. Uh, that's right. You, you, you're always on TV. You had your own disaster show in a radio. Yes. But Wala suddenly, na Close oh, na <laughs> suddenly, suddenly during uh, the pandemic last year, 
Well, I started to see on television a Joma Rabahante and a Peter Kaiton being interviewed on GMA, on AMC, right. on radio, on Double B. So, Jomar and Peter, uh, Jomar first. Uh, uh, you were doing stuff, but you were translating it to the people on uh, mainstream media. Can you tell us about that uh, that role as a scientist, as a mathematician? Yeah, um, it's actually very hard to to talk in front of you know of the camera and talking to various kinds of audience because first I'm not trained as a risk communicator but of course there there were some trainings on how to translate our math our science to simple language but definitely it's it's, it's really a first time for me to do that but I think the 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 highlight there is what we are saying is very valuable to all of us and yes. i think from that point of view people were able to to realize yeah this is this is this this problem is uh not just you know a, a usual problem it is a science problem it is a a problem that uh, needs um uh cooperation among disciplines and uh to there are many models that we we created no and one of that is we did not just created an epidemiological model, but also with socioeconomics. So we created yes. job risk calculator. We created the workplace micro simulator. So, so that people will realize that uh, this is not just you know a, 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 a usual problem, not just an academic problem. It's a science problem that is you know for the people that that will help many right. many sectors. Hmm. So you had many solutions in your in your portfolio that you were bringing out directly from now not in a scientific journal or not a mathematics journal but in mainstream media being interviewed by probably someone who doesn't understand mathematics an announcer who, who doesn't understand modeling and projections and you have to explain all of this right so it's a fairly new thing for you guys uh peter uh you were also interviewed quite often at that uh juncture last year when there was so much unknown. You provided science, statistics, probabilities. You know that uh, that 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 helped uh, the people calm down and understand. And your voice is kind of a very authoritative <laughs> to me when I listen to you. You you talk like a professor and uh, you know knew what you were talking about. Tell me about that experience being on the limelight and being uh, asked by uh, all this. TV stations and radio stations to explain what the hell was happening. So, so statistics is very is a very hard pill to swallow, but we try our best to really convey the statistics, the data that we have in terms of something that could be digestible to the people. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm much of an expert in that uh, kind of work and uh, kind of work in terms of making statistics, the numbers, the data easily absorbable, but the experience there is really something of really addressing the questions of media, really addressing the questions of the people that I interact with. And it doesn't just stop with me talking about the numbers. I'm always guided by the team that uh, that is at my back, literally, right now, in terms of providing me the, the context, in terms of the statistics and the data that would really bring the message to the people. That's right. Yeah, you were like, you were like gods at that time. You guys that were doing the crunching the numbers, you were just the 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 people we had to hang on to, because you were like the prophets. You know, <laughs> like if we talked about biblical times, you were the prophets of telling what's going to happen to the pandemic, what's going to happen to our community quarantine, because you were giving us the mathematical uh, computations of the probabilities of what happens next month, next week, and uh, the, the cases in that particular time. Let me go back to uh, Mahar. So Mahar, after all of these products of these uh, mathematical models and all this particular uh, uh, NCOV uh, dashboard, uh, you came out with uh, what we call the policy papers. What, what, what did you call it, Mahar? Uh, yeah, we had the... Uh... Initially, we had the statements being issued by the UP Pandemic Response Team. And I think the first statement was uh, preparing for post-ECQ. 
uh, yes. scenarios, no? analysis and recommendations. And we came up with several other statements uh, and briefers as well. But eventually, we slowed down on it and uh, stopped no? uh, because it was, uh, uh, well, if, if, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, maybe there are other opinions, uh, creating some kind of, uh, I don't know, friction or whatever. But uh, we still maintain the information dismination through the end of that PH. But the statements, we, we sort of uh, toned down on that because uh, we knew that, uh, or at least uh, our, our, our perception was that if uh, there are comments that are negative, that would also go back to us. Uh, uh, thinking along those lines, we, we tried to slow, slow it down. Maybe I'll ask but Jomar without, and uh, Peter. Yes, Jomar and Peter were good contributors to this uh, policy papers, right? To the, that's right. Uh, uh, in fact, there were a lot of uh, contributors, no? um, Jomar and Peter, and not just the mathematicians, but also the sociologists. Yes. Right? Uh, you know all of, these, all, all, all of those who contributed. Uh, the other uh, the, the other statements were on modified community quarantine, estimating local healthcare capacity, addressing the immediate needs of all, especially the most vulnerable sectors, social interaction, and post ECQ, uh, etc. But uh, I, what, I remember what, we were one of the first to come out with an analysis of the health system. That's right. From the healthcare right. worker to the bed capacity. We were the first one to actually that's right. show that that's what uh, need what was the situation and what would happen if there were this many cases that happened. Yes, uh, EBP. But I, I'd like to highlight two very important things, no? Uh, in 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 the work that we're doing here. In fact, in the first policy policy statement, uh, we we already uh, tried to. Uh, highlight the importance of data because the data is going to be used or have to be used to generate information. And that information will not become knowledge unless it becomes useful or is used by the people. No? So yun ang isang very basic na, na principle na ginagamit. No? We have to trust in the data. We have to have that data because the data that is analyzed will be used for uh, basis in policy decision, the policy making and policy decisions. So the uh, integrity of data is very important. Very important. So that's yes. And number two, the second principle that uh, we, well, we, we tried to do no, or parang that guided us was that all of these statements, if you look at it, they were anticipatory. We use the data so that we can anticipate and before those scenarios happen, we could have already addressed those problems. It's not just current data. We don't, uh, we don't do it at the last minute as a response, but we do the anticipatory plans and activities and actions long before they happen. So that is what, what those are the guiding principles for, of effective disaster risk reduction, which yes. uh, COVID-19 is uh, we, we, one that we consider as uh, a hazard no? that has blown up into a disaster. So, so I'll ask uh, Peter, so that's very interesting. It's all about data and Peter, you crunch the data. You crunch the numbers. You even criticize the source of the data. You, I saw your very uh, academic notes <laughs> on the data being presented by our own Department of Health, uh, like uh, like a professor critiquing a thesis. <laughs> uh, tell me about how what you thought about how data was being handled or mishandled by the government at that time we had COVID nineteen. The working principle for me in terms of looking at the data is to reflect that these data, there are people, these are people. And it is by the correct way that we uh, collect, that we validate the data, that we present the data, 
we are giving justice to the experiences of people who are currently sick, who have recovered, and has sadly left us in this uh, in this world. Rest rest in peace. So it is by correcting the presentation, validating properly, uh, taking note of the different uh, changes that the DOH is doing with the data. That is, in fact, in a way, giving respect to the people behind those numbers, the people of which the story of them is what we are looking at. No wonder you love your work so much. When you look <laughs> at those numbers, you actually see people <laughs> when you look at those numbers. And when the numbers are wrong, you feel bad because yes, they have yes, yes. late deaths and early deaths and all that, all that stuff that you were questioning about. You made circles on them, and etc. <laughs> Very interesting. Jomar, uh, you were called by a multilateral bank. You know, a multilateral bank uh, started to look at your work because of our projections and our policy papers. They gave you additional work. Can, tell, can you tell me about that? Where some professional economists or financial people started to get your help as a uh, mathematician, bio, uh, bioepidemiologic mathematician? Yeah, um, I think the, the 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 baseline there is uh, during our first ECQ, uh, March 15, 17. The the idea of ECQ is not actually to be permanent. It should be temporary only to buy us time. So our group, what what we uh, the, the the philosophy behind behind our work uh, with my group is that ECQ is very temporary, and we should be fast in you know, providing strategies or recommendations to all sectors, not just with the government. Because if we're going to be so slow in you know, providing strategies, tapos na yung ECQ, we don't have much uh, time anymore to increase our healthcare capacity. So it's very late. And uh, we know some of the official groups uh, who should provide those numbers release their estimates very late. Very late. Yes. Very late. But as early as April, we released these are the numbers in terms of the healthcare capacity. These are the the points of of uh, interventions that uh, where we can control, you know, the situation. So because of that, I think because of of that philosophy, many sectors, NGOs, and uh, financial institutions ask us to help them because they know that uh, we can provide, you know, as fast as possible what they need. Yes. Well, in, in fact, you complained to me. There was uh, one private company who got your graph and then put their label into it. Right? Tell, tell, us, tell me about that story. Uh, I mean, we didn't complain, but uh, uh, well, because you, you, you noted it to me, I had to tell them that uh, uh, please recognize the author of this particular graph. Yeah, um, probably I'll just provide, Sigur, of course, there's, there's some issue with that. But I think the, the, the positive side with that is the private sector were able to, to understand the gravity of the situation. Because before, around the first week of the ECQ, they don't realize, they didn't realize that COVID-19 uh, issue is very serious. And then they, they were just thinking after a week of lockdown, they're going to be back. Back to uh, normal, yeah. After, after that. But I, I told them, no, this, this might be a, a long-term issue. And the, the solution here... The, one of the uh, solution here is to have vaccine, which might, uh, you know, arrive a, a year or two years later. So that's the only time they they realize, okay, this will affect their businesses. This will affect their work. So I think with that, uh, we were able to to convince them about the the gravity of the situation. And I think uh, that's a good contribution of the UP group to the economy. To the economy. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, what you you were also being uh, mentioned by uh, uh, other people because uh, you comp- you lo- you got all the know how you got all the statistics of the different local governments and started to provide uh, information to them. Uh, tell me more about how that became useful to the local governments. Were they contacting you? Were there uh, epidemiology units contacting you for use of what you compound your compendium you called it the, the compendium so what happened with that is uh 
coming from the statistical activities that we've done, uh, I've also done some work with local government units in I terms see. of empowering them with the data that they have so that they could also make the decisions on the ground in terms of the, uh, the, the speed of transmission through the reproduction number, the tracking of recoveries and deaths in their area. And this goes down to even the barangay level of which in some instances, in some LGUs, we are also able to provide the rate of transmission through the reproduction number. Uh, how fast COVID is spreading through the barangays. And in addition to that, more recently, we've had gained a lot of exposure with the kind of maps that uh, UP COVID-19 pandemic response team is producing in yeah. terms of showing the story of the situation of COVID-19 really through the maps, the the density of cases that are re uh, uh, we've do, we've been doing this for NCR for quite a while, and more recently with the work that we're doing with the mappers of the UP Res uh, Resilience Institute, we've been slowly expanding them to the uh, adjacent regions of NCR, and more. And in the future, we will make that more interactive with the whole country. You educated me about the RT. Because at that time, I only know, know of the reproductive number or the R0. But then you came up with a figure in one of our threads of discussion, the, the time-varying reproductive number or RT. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that and how that came about. That's, that became used by everyone, by all the modelers and the, uh, all the people making projections. Uh, with regards to RT, it's really a novel research of this millennia. The way to monitor in real time the spread of the transmission of any epidemic. We just uh, patterned it for COVID-19. Now, still there is this growth of research about uh, the time varying reproduction number, but it is that very important metric, even recognized by the World Health Organization. So let me just describe what RT is. So given that you have previously, uh, previously infected cases of COVID-19 for our situation, how many do we typically expect them to spread to other cases as well. So for a typical case, for a person that's typically have COVID-19, how many would they pass it on to others? And the way that we analyze it is so long as it is greater than one, yung RT, then the pandemic is still uh, transmitting exponentially. If it's in less than one, then that it means that the pandemic is slowing down to a point that uh, cases are new cases are getting less and less, and then the WHO has embraced this statistic yes. more recently. Fantastic! Uh, and we went all the way down to an RT of uh, zero point six, but now it's again one point four, I think, or one point five. So, uh, very useful guide, Mahar. You were called to Malacanang <laughs> because of all of this uh, data being produced by these uh, scientists and uh, all your uh, dashboards and NCOV. You were called to Malacanang. How was that experience? That is something that I think UP needs to do more. Uh, we've been doing that during the time of NOAA from 2012 to 2017, but I think it needs to be expanded because the UP faculty, the, U, the experts from UP have a lot of uh, things to say, have a lot to say no? in terms of uh, uh, data and the analysis of the data sets. No? Because after all, the, a lot of the experts are taught by UP faculty. And, um, and a lot of the things that they work on are real-life matters, such as this pandemic. We... we we just communicated. We just communicated what the UP people had to say, and I think what Jomar was saying at that time was uh, something about the interaction of uh, of the age groups, no, uh, which I think had a lot of uh, influence on the decision also to uh, shut down the the physical schools. No? Um, that's one. 
And uh, there were others. Uh, I think I was also given the opportunity to speak uh, to the public uh, sa Malacanang Press Corps. The following day, um, right? Yes. Basically, what, what, what I'm saying is that uh, that that should be done more. Uh, when it comes and you connected with the DILG secretary important. also. You connected Excuse with me? the you connected with the DILG secretary, secretary Anyo. Remember, after that's that, right. after that's your correct. talk, they uh, they fact, search you out and ask you to help them in the that's local correct. government. That's uh, correct. In fact, um, after the presentation, I remember receiving a small note, a, a small note. <laughs> Sorry, a small note that was my my daughter. Uh, a small note, a slip uh, with a note from uh, Secretary Anyo uh, to talk afterwards. And uh, we were actually, uh, we, we met up and then we talked about the uh, system to generate the, the data from the LGUs. Yes. And the reason why we tried to, to, to do that was because we needed to maximize the potential of uh, digital technology. It cannot be all hard copies that uh, then you send it and then translate it. We must take advantage of digital technology because we have to act faster, make use of technologies and be faster than the virus. As of the moment, our infrastructure on the, on, uh, the internet, uh, uh, with regards to the internet, is, uh, the internet is much lower than the virus. So we need, to, we need to work on that. We need to have done that a long time ago. Uh, and that could have helped. Uh, we were trying to maximize that by getting the data from the LGU so that Peter and Jomar and the rest of the UP team could uh, work on these data sets. Well, uh, you know, my time is up for this episode. Uh, I'll ask a few parting words from each one of you. Maybe Jomar, you start with you, then Peter, yeah. and then Mahar. Um, the one of that, the lessons that I've learned from this UP uh, COVID-19 pandemic response team is to trust your colleagues as a fam like a family. Actually, I, I'm, you know, as a scientist, sometimes we are uh, sort of thinking no one should correct me like that. But no, I, I, in this group, in this family, I learned how to not to be insecure if people will, will comment, will critique my work. And with that, actually, we were able to discuss uh, fruitfully what are the best models, how to improve our models. Even with Peter, Peter would tell me, Jomar, we need to, to do some resimulation of our work because the cases are you know, going out of the, the, the trap. So we, we, we do that as a, an adaptive system so we can, we can help the community without any you know, insecurity as a scientist. And this is, I think this is the science that we need now to be able to improve our work without thinking how our ego will be, you know. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the lesson that I learned. Collaboration. From. We call Collab that collab in disaster research, we call that collaboration. Peter, final words from you. For me, uh, I really started as a statistician who's more into the economics and finance of things. And then, so with how I'm doing with a lot of the statistics for COVID-19 and for the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team, it's really built from the knowledge and insights coming from the team, coming from the different experts, the pool of faculty, the pool of researchers that are in the team that makes me bring the message of the data to more people, to a wider audience, and to a better platform. Thank you. The, uh, the team, the, the word team was so appropriate. Huh? Uh, Mahar, you know, what were yeah. your learnings or lessons from this uh uh, pandemic team? Well, we learn something new every day. No? We keep on learning. Uh, I have learned a lot from the people from the pandemic response team, from Jomar, from uh, Peter. Uh, and I think what is important is that uh, during problems, during times where we have a crisis, that we really work uh, together. Uh, especially for disaster risk reduction. The Sendai framework tells us that, tells us that, that uh, it has to be a whole-of-society approach and it must be a science-based approach. We have a very good uh, uh, contribution to the UP system in terms of uh, the knowledge that all of uh, these talents that we have in the UP pandemic response team uh, has offered no, or can offer. 
and we need to to you know build that build that community uh, because science is the one that can deliver us from uh, all of these uh, hardships all of these crises that we are experiencing we have to trust in science because science works thank you very much uh, professor mahar professor peter and professor jomar din jomar thank you very much for joining us this needs another issue of uh, health issues because we still have to discuss our dashboard and all the data and how we manage data but to today i'd like to thank all three of you for telling us the story the human side of how we were able to contribute to the country's response from the point of view of academia from the point of view of scientists all doing three things that i learned in disaster school the three c's of disasters command meaning having a structure uh, collaboration meaning different specialists taking take care of everything and third communications making sure that the knowledge you create is communicated to the people with that this is dr ted adbosa thank you very much for joining us in today's health issues at tvup